my infrastructure, I splurged. It was 4995. It's 100 feet long. It's orange, <laughs> black at both ends. I could have got a 1995 25 foot infrastructure. Uh, it's really hard to operate. You plug one end in the car and the other end in the garage socket. Works fine. We can make some substantial steps and we can deal with in questions uh, how this will not uh, require new power plants, at least for a long time, and how it does improve the situation with respect to, uh, to uh, global warming gas emissions, uh, but there are major national studies that make those two points clear. The other thing I believe we can do is require that all vehicles be flexible fuel and be open to the use of a wide range of alcohol-based fuels, not picking winners, not picking necessarily corn-based ethanol or anything else, but a wide range of fuels. This costs less than $100 a car. It's just a different kind of plastic in the fuel line on a little software reprogramming. Virtually all cars in Brazil are flexible fuel vehicles. Millions on the road in the United States are. Once we break oil's monopoly by making that rather simple change, we open the market up to people experimenting with different ways of producing ethanol, methanol, butanol, all sorts of blends and possibilities, and we make, take another step toward opening up the possibility of using something other than oil products to drive with. I gave some remarks in Washington a few months ago and said that my plug-in Prius, given that I had the overnight electricity and was able to use it for the first 20 miles anyway every day, got about 150 to 200 miles per gallon, and then 45 miles a gallon after that. But that if my Prius had a different kind of plastic in the fuel line and could use 85 percent ethanol or methanol or any alcohol fuel, I'd be getting 500 to 1,000 miles per gallon of gasoline using technologies that are now on the road. The plug-ins in the hundreds and in a prototype, early adopter type way, flexible fuel vehicles, millions, virtually all cars in Brazil. This is not, does not mean you need a Manhattan project. Does not mean you need an Apollo project. It means you need to apply and incentivize existing and improving technologies. After I said 500 to 1,000 miles per gallon, a gentleman I've known for some years from a uh, country that produces a great deal of oil came up to uh, see me at the podium and he said, Jim, 500 to 1,000 miles per gallon, you're going to destroy my country. I said, we don't want to destroy you. But we do think you ought to get real work. <laughs> Thank you. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're listening to Mr. Jim Woolsey, venture partner with Vantage Point Ventures and former CIA director. We will return to our speaker in just a minute for our traditional City Club questions. We encourage you to formulate questions for our speaker now and remind you your, your questions should be brief and hopefully to the point. We welcome all of you here and those listening to WCPN 90.3 FM, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Radio broadcasts of the City Club are made possible through the generous support of Case Western Reserve University. Our television broadcast partners are WVIZ, PBS, IdeaStream, and Time Warner Cable. Television broadcasts are supported by National City and Cleveland State University, and our live webcasts are supported by the University of Akron. <coughs> Today's forum is the annual Craig Spagenberg Memorial Forum which recognizes a very generous gift from Spangenberg, Shibley, and Liebert LLP to the City Club Forum Foundation Endowment. We are pleased to welcome guests at a table hosted by Baker Hostetler. Thank you for joining us today. We are pleased to welcome to our forum students who are here as part of our City Club student program. 
Participation of these students is made possible by a generous grant from the Jeffrey David Epstein Memorial Student Fund. With us today are students from Rocky River, Canton South, Bedford, and North Olmsted High Schools. Would our student guests please stand and be recognized? <laughs> nice to have you with us today. Now we'd like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today are City Club Director of Development, Jessica Allen, and Outreach Co Coordinator, Deborah Agosti. Now, first question. Mr. Woolsey, um, your presentation seemed totally logical to me and well-founded in facts, etc. And I'm wondering, um, First of all, are we paying the price for our politicians being for sale in terms of the lobbying that's gone on to prevent some of these uh, transitions to other kinds of energy? And also, what, what is standing in the way of our converting and, and moving in the direction you're suggesting? Well, there has been some movement in recent years and months on uh, this issue. Um, I mean. Part of the problem here is that three of the four or five largest industries in the world, uh, electricity, oil and gas, and automotive, are still basically, and I think this is only a slight exaggeration, operating on 19th century business plans. Uh, electricity companies, power companies, uh, produce electricity, string transmission and distribution lines, sell it to consumers, and in most states only make money by selling more and more electricity, even if some of it is wasted. Automotive companies bend steel, uh, produce cars with gasoline, the gasoline goes in. Uh, oil and gas companies uh, drill, refine, distribute, and put the gasoline in the cars. Um, all three of those industries are fairly conservative, small c, and have not readily uh, made changes. But you are starting to see some very interesting developments. I would uh, uh, point you to the remarks, some recently on television, other I'm sure you can find them on YouTube and so forth, of Bob Lutz, uh, the senior vice chairman of the General Motors board. Uh, Lutz has been in Detroit for nearly half a century. Uh, he's worked at all of the big three. He's, he's, he would sort of be identified with the view that if a V8 is good, a V12 must be better. Right? Um, but he still talks about wanting to sell you big cars and fast cars when you want big cars and fast cars. And then the second half of what he says is very interesting. He says, but we're going to power those cars with something other than oil. We're going to power them with electricity or with alternative liquid fuels, and we're going to have flexible fuel vehicles, and we're not going to be caught by oil anymore. That's a big change. That's a big change. There are starting to be some, some tremors here as these three huge industries try to deal with several major changes. One, 9-11 pointed out to most Americans who weren't already focused on it, the potential chaos and problems that can come to us here as well as to our friends in the area from a, the chaotic nature of the Middle East. Uh, climate change has, has concerned a great many uh, people. Uh, the price of uh, oil uh, has uh, led uh, in recent years to very substantial difficulties, particularly for poorer Americans and for, for people in developing countries who can't afford spending many tens of dollars a barrel for oil, even as well as we can. Um, and now the credit uh, uh, crisis uh, of the last uh, several months. Uh, and I think these three big industries are in very heavy seas and they're getting tossed around and they're looking for a, a course and a, and a way to go. And I commend Bob Lutz. I hope that we see some other developments like this. California has made some changes in last some, some of the original ones 20 or 30 years ago in separating for their utilities sales from earnings. In most states, you only make more money as a utility if you sell more electricity. California stopped that 25 to 30 years ago and we started giving a return on investment instead of sales or other factors at work, but per capita use of electricity in California has been absolutely flat for 25 to 30 years. The rest of the country, it's gone up 